Hats off for you. Yeah, yo. There whenever it matters and even more when you feel like it doesn't Protect you so you never feel like you wasn't Know I'm right alongside you, here by that I'm behind you But always got you, end the discussion, nothing means more First one to offer his shoulders for what you preach for Thought I saw the eyes of the world until I seen yours And know that I ain't see a better view yet I'm with whatever, so don't ever you fret Know that you covered, not a hurdle or a heartbreak To change what a part take Cause none of them won't ever get comfortable in your walkway My job is to aware you, fully loaded to prepare you for all of the above that I'm never letting get near you but still in all give you every advantage I found couldn't find a better fit for them along with my crown and since the baton was passed I've been down cause feeling's not an option and dad is not a noun not at all how you doing sir what's up brother how are you man I'm doing awesome happy Tuesday man happy Tuesday happy Tuesday to you as well Thank you for taking the time to chat up with me um, here at Dad Is Not A Noun. Um, let me tell you a little about it. Dad Is Not A Noun is a social media platform dedicated for men of color and fatherhood. So it's all about um, a fraternity when it comes to fatherhood. I'm not a father, but I recognize greatness in fathers. So this is a, my platform just to shout out fathers and just men of color that's doing great things. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, I'm a man of color and I'm also a father, so... Uh, <laughs> awesome man I, I read your bio i gave a little description there man you're a man you're a man of a, a jack of all trades man you do uh a, 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 a plethora of things man yeah. uh, you're like a, a renaissance man like a throwback paul robeson <laughs> kind of guy because you just do so many things man so where did this Thank come you. from where did this origin begin of being this renaissance man yeah yeah you know man it's funny because um, from a very early age, all of the things that I am currently doing, I did all of the things as a child. Wow. Um, from, from an early age, I you know, always wanted to either be a preacher, a teacher, a dancer, or all three. Um, and I think when my parents noticed the gifting and skill that I had in all three of those areas, they really poured into me and they also really uh, poured into that. And as a result of that, I've been able to continue um, from a young age doing the thing that I love and that I'm passionate about. And so, you know, as an adult, um, I've, had, right. I've had an opportunity to function in all of those capacities um, and really excited about that. And so, yes, all of this comes from just an early age, having parents who are invested um, and really keen enough to see what my gifts and talents were and then quickly move on those gifts and talents. And then also, where did you learn the art of empathy and passion for towards other people? Because a lot of people don't have that. So where did that come from? Yeah, so I think the, the idea of empathy and, and compassion and you know, love for other people really, again, comes from my family. And so I come from a spiritual family. I come from a family who's loving and who's nurturing. Um, and I also come from a family who's really invested in the community. And so that idea of caring for others and nurturing others and guiding and leading others um, was something that was innate in our family. And as a result of being in the family, you know, you just picked up those traits as well. And so I think that that, that ideology really was learned you know, initially learned in my family, and then you know, throughout my own life, I've been able to adopt more of that empathy, compassion, and love and nurturing. So, yeah, definitely. And then also, how did you, how being a part of the a member of Phi, Phi Delta Kappa, Kappa Alpha, kind of help you when it comes to fraternity and family? How did that kind of help you in your road and your journey? So, yeah, so so Kappa Alpha Psi, um is um, a fraternity um, that is like no other. Of course, I would say that, right? But, but it is, <laughs> it is, it is. Um, at an early age, uh, I was a part of many activities um, that were led and run by Catholics. And so I saw men who were excellent in what they did. I saw men who worked together um, as, as brothers. And I really wanted to be a part of something like that. And so... I think the way in which Kappa has um, filtered through my life, if you will, is really just the need and the desire to work with other young men, uh, other men 
um, in a space of unity and love, right? To accomplish one common goal. I have a very brotherly kind of presence. And I think that that directly comes from um, my experiences uh, pledging and being a part of, you know, what I call the greatest fraternity in the world. <laughs> I feel you on that, brother. Yeah. And then also, let's talk about history and art. How do you utilize that to enhance um, kids? Because I think that plays a big role in cultivating kids is through arts, whether it's music, dance, and then also learning them about, learning about history. So how did you, how are you able to infuse that? Yeah, I think one came before the other. So I think the arts came before the history piece. Um, the arts is something that is near and dear to my heart. Like I said initially, that I've always had a passion and desire to dance. And my parents were able to um, pour into me and so was able to have technical training as well. So I started um, an all-boys dance company about 12 years ago, Sons of Freedom Dance Institute. And that was really an effort to um, nurture character development, increase social awareness, and build spirituality through classical and contemporary forms of dance and movement but also give boys, black boys specifically, an opportunity to exist in a group with each other and understand what it means to be in a brotherhood and understand what it means to be a part of a group where everybody has a common goal, which in this case was the arts and specifically was dance and movement. So uh, we use the arts in a real sense to teach uh, brotherhood. We use the arts to teach character. We use the arts to increase the level of social awareness that our boys had. And we use the arts to teach our boys history, right? Um, many of our children outside, outside of being in spaces in the arts, many of our children don't have an understanding of our rich history and their cultural legacy. And so dance and the arts is something that can be utilized greater than just the technical aspect of the art, but rather as a tool to teach history and cultural legacy. And so that's really what I've been doing, using the arts to teach our children, you know, their cultural legacy. And even in this, this second book of mine, I Am My History, you know, it's a work of art, right? It's visual art, it's illustration, it's poetry. And so that in and of itself is art. And so we've used art to, again, make sure that our children understood and knew about their history and cultural legacy. Uh, so before we get into the book, tell me a little bit about Cultivating Young Kings. I love, I, I love that. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so Cultivating Young Kings um, came about a little later on in my life. Um, I saw the need for educators, school leaders, mentors, anyone who worked directly um, with black and brown boys. I saw the need um, for them to develop best practices when working with young men. And as a result of seeing that need, um, just decided that I would create a space for educators and mentors and school leaders to come and get those best practices. So Cultivating Young Kings has a threefold um, program, which the first part is an annual uh, conference where we share with educators best practices in working with boys. The second is a conference or summit that um, is run by uh, boys of color and um, is attended by boys of color. So it's called Kings Empowering Kings. So I believe in young men empowering and imparting to each other. And so that's another prong of cultivating young kings. And then the last portion is just offering professional developments to schools who say, hey, you know, we may not be an all boys school. We may not have an all boys program, but we are invested in making sure that our boys get the resources and the things necessary in order for them to have successful outcomes. And so that's really um, how Cultivating Young Kings came about. And that's really what Cultivating Young Kings is. Opportunity to give resources and provide best practices for educators um, and also to empower young kings. And then also, can you give me some challenges you had a little bit challenges you have with it too, because I know everything is not uh, roses, rose petals, and everything like that. Absolutely. So it had to be some struggles. So kind of tell me a little struggles you you had with um, cultivating cultivating kings in the early days. So again, cultivating young kings is fairly new, and so we really haven't encountered many struggles. I think currently the struggle is. Um, offering some of this support and resources to families, I'm sorry, to educators and to school leaders virtually, right? When we're preparing to offer these 
skills and best practices um, physically. And so that's, that's created or is creating somewhat of a challenge, but just a small challenge. Um, I think the biggest challenge really is for me um, on a whole other side, which is really just balancing it all, right? Like making sure that we're providing what we need to provide for our families, but also making sure that I'm providing what we need to provide for educators as well. Um, so I really think that's the challenge. I mean, I think that both Cultivating Young Kings and Sons of Freedom Dance Institute, you run into some of the, you know, business challenges that every small business owner faces, you know, whether it's financial challenges, whether it is programmatic challenges where you're trying to kind of increase programming and, you know, you may not have the budget or the finances or even the space or capacity to do so. I think those are general challenges, but I think overall, um, my time leading Sons of Freedom Dance Institute and Cultivating Young Kings um, has been pretty smooth, and 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 it's been a joy um, to be on this on this journey. That's awesome, man. Yeah. And then also, how do you balance the two of being a father as well as having your hands on many other things? So how do you balance the two? Well, <clears throat> quick quick thing: the blessing for being a father currently is that I don't have a young child, and so I have a, a, a an older child. So my son is nineteen years old, and so. You know, the balancing portion at this point is much easier than it was when he was, I don't know, seven or eight. The benefit for me, however, when he was seven or eight is that he was extremely connected to being a dancer. And right. so that was great because he was able to be in the company. And so much of the work that I did with the company, he was a part of. And so a lot of my parenting happened through the lenses of him being in the dance company. Um, and then as he got a little older, he decided that he wanted to play sports and all of those pieces. And so, you know, I guess I would say to people who are, who have a business, who are balancing, you know, fatherhood, I would say one of the most important things are, 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 it is making sure that if you need to shut off the business so that you can be a father, that's the main priority, right? Um, and the other caveat to that is unless you can find an opportunity to incorporate your children in the business or in the work that you do, which is what I did, right? Um, but that doesn't always work. And so, you know, I learned to balance it by knowing and realizing and recognizing and always keeping in front of me, you know, what was and what is the most important, which is making sure that my son is successful and making sure that he has all of the things that he needs in order, you know, for him to journey through life with confidence, with awareness, with pride, and with all the skills to be successful. Awesome. And then also, let's get into the book, I Am My History. I love the illustration. Um, the illustrator is CJ Love. So how did you connect with him to do the, to do the illustration part? Yep. So CJ Love is, um, <clears throat> uh, he, he resides here where I live. So we, we live in the same area. Um, I have a close friend who also wrote a children's book about a year or two ago, and uh, he used CJ as an illustrator. And so when it came time for me to, to you know, do I in my history, I quickly reached out to CJ, and I was grateful because he was available. Um, and that's really how the process began. Working with CJ is really a joy. And I've been on several different, you know, interviews talking to people about this, but the reality is that working with him has been an, an extreme joy. One, he's easy to work with, but two, just like myself, he's a visionary. And so, you know, a visionary and a creative. And so, you know, we were able to bounce ideas off of each other um, to produce the product that you see today, which is an amazing work of art, right? Um, aside from the poetry being impactful, when you look at the illustrations, I wanted people to feel like, I wanted children to feel like they were a part of every scene, which is why wow. we made the affirmational statement that I am my history, yes. because yes. we wanted them to be a part of it. And so not only do you see children a part of the scenes that are happening throughout history in the book, but I wanted our, our young people who are reading the book to also feel like they were a part. So because CJ's a creative and because CJ's a visionary, and because CJ is all about youth empowerment, the process with working with CJ Love has been extremely uh, smooth, and uh, he will be my illustrator forever. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That's dope. Because the title of the book kind of reminds me of the the Memphis um, pro, uh, protests back in the days for the 
the garbage collectors back in the days when you see the sign that said, I am a man. So that kind of has that same vibe to it, which is pretty dope. I love it because it's like the title said, I am my history, which is true. We are our history. We have a thread connection to the past. That's and right. going back to the, the illustration, the cover of the book, I love that bronze image because it kind of reminds me of um, – like uh classic uh statues of uh black figures, you know, like um like a figure of Paul Robeson or a uh, uh, Dr. King. So was that a, a tent intentional to do that? Yes, that was intentional to do that, right? It was intentional to have the young man in bronze and to have the young man as a statue. Um I've said this before too that in a real sense, when you look at this young man on this, you know, on this cover, when you look at him, you know, when we think of a, mo a memorial, a memorial pays tribute to somebody or an event, right, in history. And so I wanted young people to, from the very beginning, recognize that their history is something that needs to be memorialized, something that needs to be remembered, something that needs to be a part of who they are. And so we wanted to make sure that the cover um, expressed that, that you are a part of this history. All these memorials that we see that are dedicated to black and brown people and their contributions to our country and to our world, that you're connected to that. And then also it's funny that you bring up the slogan, I am a man, which was created by Dr. Bill Losi, um, and who, who in, in Memphis, Tennessee, because of the you know sanitation workers uh, strike, which all gets into right. like, why Martin Luther King Jr. was in Tennessee and all yeah. those pieces. Yeah, you know, but we also want to make sure that young people connected to that as well, you know. And so the hope is that educators or parents or people will begin to talk about these things with their young people. Well, why is it I'm in my history? And then right. a parent or an educator can say, well, let me share with you, you know, another time in history, you know, where this affirmational statement was created, you know. That statement, I am a man, was created because in a real sense, those sanitation workers were not getting paid what they deserved yep. to be getting paid. And so in a real sense, it made them feel like they were less than human and it made them feel like they were less than men. And so those signs in a real sense was an affirmational statement in light of what society was placing on them and how society felt about them. And so I wanted to make that same bold statement that in spite of school systems not teaching our children their cultural legacy in spite of the images that our children see regarding black and brown bodies and the disregard of black and brown bodies that our children are still a part of a rich legacy and so all of the things that you see on the cover of the book are highly intentional um the cover in and of itself i tell people all the time if you're not having a conversation with the cover with your child about the cover, you've already missed it, right? That <laughs> conversation begins with the cover of the book. And I totally agree with that. Um, what's your favorite part of the book? And then also, when you talk about historical figures, what are some of the unsung heroes that, that's in that book? I haven't got a chance to read the book, but is there any unsung heroes in that book? Can you name a few? Absolutely. So the first part is my favorite part. Um, so some people who have been watching for a while already know what my favorite part is. <laughs> this is my favorite part of the book. Wow. That is awesome. It's my favorite wow. part of the book for multiple reasons. When you get a chance to see up close, there are all of these references to the things that are currently happening in our society. From yes. COVID-19 to the killing of George Floyd uh, to Black Lives Matter and the movement. All of these things are represented in this uh, illustration. But I love the words of this page, which are, I am a powerful source of peace. I yes. a brave, beautiful light. I am essential to the earth. I am the glimmering hope in the darkness of night. I think that's just wow. a powerful affirmational statement. And so that's my favorite part of the book. As it relates to some unsung heroes, uh, there are many references to those heroes. First, starting off with the wealthiest man in the world, who we yes. know as Mansa Musa, who yes. was the emperor of the Mali Empire. Um, Thank so you. Tribute to Mansa Musa, tribute to King Tut, tri tribute to Queen Nefertiti. The thing that Thank we don't you for that. About, about Queen Nefertiti 
is that Queen Nefertiti, she was what I call, she was a black girl who rocked, right? Yes, she, she did. She was responsible <laughs> for leading her people by herself. Her husband died. And yep. they looked to her to lead. And she was really what we consider to be, she was the first black woman president, yeah. if you will. There you go, facts. If, facts. If, if you will. And so we wanted to make references to Queen Nefertiti so that kids would ask. Um, and then we have references to um, Harriet Tubman. Yes. Um, yes. We have references to Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Jackie Robinson, um, the you know Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, you know Black Wall Street. So yes. all these things are there, and there's a teaching guide that I really encourage educators and parents to pick up because the teaching guide gives gives them an opportunity to extend the conversation if they're trying to figure out how to do that. The teaching guide helps them to continue to have more conversations about children's history and cultural legacy, Black children's history and cultural legacy. And the, the one thing I love about the book that you're telling me about, it kind of gives me that vibe of, like, I don't know if you, like, as old as me, um, I'm a kind of old dude, that be. back in the days of, like, when family get together and they would, like, uh, stay in front of the radio, that, that book has that same kind of vibe to it where, yeah. you know, it gets the family together. It may be stuff that parents may not know, that the kid may know and they may educate their kid and vice versa. So I I love I love that. That is dope, man. Yep. It's funny because I have a close friend. I think she was on at some point, but um she's a special education teacher in Atlanta and she shared this book with her children. And so what she did was, which I loved, she began to she started off with just asking kids, Do you know who these people are? Right? And wow. she was fully prepared to share with the kids who they were. But the kids were able to share with her who those, who those people were. And um, I think that's so important. Whether, you know, whether the kids are sharing with the teacher or whether the teacher is sharing with the kids, this is a book that extends the pages that you see or that you read. It's a book that really begins the conversation about why our children knowing their history is important, how learning their history can be impactful for their identity, and for their successful uh, lives, for, for having successful lives, and then how it is that we can, you know, approach conversations with others, you know, about race and about you know, inequality and about inequity, you know, in a real sense, you know, our people are people who created, you know, these, <clears throat> these, these ideologies and, you know, who created some of the systems, right? However, you know, because of the pervasiveness of racism, um, what our people have done and the contributions of black and brown people have been overshadowed by systemic racism um, and systematic oppression. And so this book gives an opportunity for children to finally understand that our history began before 1619, when you you know, the African diaspora was created, yeah. that our history began much, much, much longer um, before that and that our people are responsible for some major contributions um, in the world. And I wanted our children to know what those were. And I wanted our children to, um, you know, to, to bask in the power and the impact um, in the courage, the resilience and creativity of those ancestors and those who came before them. And I totally love it, man, because, you know, our history didn't start from slavery. We right. way before slavery. And I think that's important. And I love what you're doing with this book. Also, will there be a part two? Were there people that you wanted in the book that you couldn't get in the book? Or are we going to get a part two? Yeah, so a few people have <laughs> asked that before. So so unfortunately, there will not be a part two to oh, I Am My History. Yeah, there will not be a part two to I Am My History. You know, I think that in a real sense, I wanted I Am My History to be a conversation starter. I do believe that there will be multiple teaching tools for both parents and educators to utilize to continue those conversations. Um, during the month of Black History, I'll be coming out with a series of Black History presentations for educators and for parents where they can, you know, have conversations and share presentations um, and discussions with their children about, you know, significant people in our, in our history and in our culture. Um, but there will not be a part two. Um, what oh, we want to do now is what we want to do now is we want to shift a little um, from you know embracing black and brown boys and girls to then being more intentional about 
um, who were targeted. And so right. the next book, which will be titled BJ's Dancing Feet, mm. um, really celebrates the power of the of dance and movement, specifically the arts, um, and its impact on black and brown boys, which is something wow. that we really don't talk about, black boys dancing. And so yeah. that is the very next book. And then after BJ's Dancing Feet, there's a book for, 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 for my black and brown queens, which is entitled Every Time I Feel the Spirit. And that book talks about the spirit of black women and how the spirit of our ancestors, those women who paved the way, how that spirit is resident in all of the black and brown girls in our world. Um, and so that's the next thing. So I and My History is one and done. Um, but, but shortly after is BJ's Dancing Feet and Every Time I Feel the Spirit. I'm just saying, man, I can't wait to get my copy of the book. I can't wait till the other two come out. I'm excited. Um, Thank you. Uh, what is coming up for you down the road? Are you doing any kind of virtual reading? What's mm -hmm. coming down the pipeline for you personally? Absolutely. So as a matter of fact, um, this coming Sunday, um, there is an organization that is called the Black Boy Book Club, and I will be doing my first reading um, with the Black Boy Book Club, which is an organization that really puts books, picture books of black and brown boys in front of black and brown boys, which is so amazing. Um, we always talk about book clubs, but we very seldom talk about book clubs for children and right. even more seldom for boys specifically. And so I'll be doing my first reading on this Sunday, and anybody who's interested in logging on um, to hear that reading, which will be interactive, and it'll have some multimedia things happening. It won't just be me reading. Um, that is on this Sunday at 11 a.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, and all the information will be um, on my Instagram, which is Brian underscore Keith underscore Harris, so people can sign on if you have a young man, if you know a young man, and um, they can they can hear the book uh, firsthand. So that's that's the immediate thing that that is that is coming up for me. Um, I do plan on doing a uh, book signing, if you will, a virtual book signing, um, just kind of working it out because I want to be creative. I don't want to do the age old book signing yeah. um, because this book is not the age old book, right? right. It's, a, it's a different type of book. And so I've been uh, waiting to really hear from God and the ancestors about how it is that I should bring this book even more to the earth than it currently is. Um, and how I can incorporate things like, you know, drumming and dancing and all wow. of those pieces to this book signing. And so those things are coming up, but continuing to do interviews, um, continuing to do author talks. I'll be doing some author talks at some schools, um, you know, like I said, doing the reading for, for this organization and just doing the work, man. You know, I um, started school today, the school that I work at started today. And so you know, I'll be continuing to work with our young men there, uh, the Bishop Walker School for Boys in Washington, D.C., grades K through five. And so that's up next for me. Awesome. And my last question, what does inspiration mean to you? I think inspiration is a surge of energy that one receives when he or she is most connected to his or her gift and purpose on the earth. That's deep, man. We're going to leave it off to that. Mr. Uh, Harris, thank you for taking the time to talk to me. I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy man. I know you probably got home like, oh, I just want to relax. I want to watch the game because the game is on. And now I got to do this interview. <laughs> no, no, it's been a joy. It's been a joy. Thank you so much for the opportunity, brother. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the work that you're doing, right? Like, I appreciate the opportunity and the and the spotlight on black and brown fathers um, and black men who are acting as, um, or living as, I don't like to say acting, living as fathers and father figures. Yeah, because I just feel like right now, I, I use an a old saying by... Um, Thomas Freeman. I don't know if you remember this book. He came out with a book a couple of years ago called The World is Flat. It, it was basically about the Iraq war. And so I use that same analogy, but when it comes to social media and the internet, is that now the world is flat. We're all connected due to social media. And it's what we do with it, because now we no longer have to go to corporate media to spread the word. We can do it ourselves. Right. And so if I can do my part, if another brother can do his part, 
another sister can do our part and then it spreads like oops, excuse me not to spit it <laughs> it spreads like wildfire and then anything's possible i say i say well we'll continue to do this work brother i appreciate the opportunity truly thank you thank you man i'm gonna get my copy i'm gonna get a couple of copies and then also it's gonna be a part of my affirmation matter giveaway nice. um right now i'm giving away a book nice. by wordsworth uh the words are worth sign he signed it so i got four copies i sent one out so i'm gonna send four more so all people have to do is follow me i'll send people a dm and then the book is theirs. And that's how I'm going to do the same thing with your book, too. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that, brother. It's awesome. Thank you for the support, man. My pleasure. And then also, in the DM, send me that information, because when I upload the video on on uh, Instagram, I'm going to put all the links and everything into the, in, into the upload. So when people Absolutely. watch the video, then, you know, they can link to it. And then later on, um, I think probably tomorrow, what I'll do is... I'll upload it on my YouTube page too. Awesome, awesome. And so they can watch it on YouTube and then also they can link on to the different links that you send me that I'll have on there too. Good deal, good deal. All right, cool brother, I appreciate that. That's awesome. I appreciate you too, man. Don't be a stranger, man. Anytime you got anything new, let me know. Indeed, thank you, sir. All right, brother. All right, All right. peace.